introduced each other on screen. There's no need to do introductions. Um, I Sorry, guess that... is it YouTube or are you just recording it? Um, you... just, just recording and will be on YouTube at a okay. later date. Yeah. Maybe for the purposes of those who may be accessing the recorded material, can we just quickly go around and introduce ourselves? Teresa, can we start with you left to right? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Teresa Hancock. Um, I'm on the communications team at Waikato District Council. I support the community growth team, of which Rochelle is a value team member. Sue? I'm Sue Edmonds. I'm chair of the Community Planning Committee for Eureka, but I've also been involved in politics and worked at Parliament, so I'm always interested in these sort of events, I think. And a writer of some note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to write a memoir, and that'll go to the oh, good on you. You people. <laughs> Councillor Maguire? Yeah, Councillor for the Eureka Ward in the wake of the District Council. The southern Councilor end Beck. of. Councillor Beck? Thank you. It doesn't work. Uh, you know, Rochelle's saying going from the left because everyone's in a different position. Oh, on the, I guess so. <laughs> <on the> front. <laughs> yeah. So it's good if you say the name. Um, yeah, so Axel Beck, uh, councillor for uh, Tamahiri Ward. And um, and as you've alluded to, Rochelle also on the Future Proof Implementation Committee uh, that's um, behind this uh, this work that, uh, that you're going to talk to much more eloquently than I could uh, tonight. Councillor Willerton. Uh, Chris, Chris Wollerton, uh, Council for the Hukanui Whiting Award. Um, and so we're on, I'm on the eastern side, northeastern. Greg? Yep, Greg Weechin, I'm Chair of the Narrowhead Community Board. Council Church? You're on mute. <laughs> there you go, oh, sorry. <laughs> So Jackie Church, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Jackie Church, Council for Arokitoka, uh, one of the board councillors on the North Waikato for the Auckland border. Liam. Yeah, hi, uh, Liam McGrath. I'm the chairman for the Mercer Community Committee. Great. I think that's that's it, Teresa. That's all we've got on screen for now. Um, I'm Vishal Ramduni, for those who don't know me. I'm the Strategic Project Manager um, and the H2A Corridor Initiative is one of the projects I'm involved in supporting Councillor Beck and Mayor Allen on the Future Proof Implementation um, Committee. Um, so essentially the purpose of today's session is to provide you with an update on the H2A, the Hamilton to Auckland Corridor Initiative with regards to its key work streams and I'll provide an overview of these work streams shortly and the associated projects. And um, by the way, I did receive two apologies, one from Councillor Patterson and one from Councillor Gibb, uh, the two councillors for Narawai here who are engaged in another event um, this afternoon. Um, but they do um, express um, their sincere apology and um, they are very keenly uh, aware of the content of this presentation. So with that, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good. I'm just going to put this, there you go. All right. Look, I think we're all familiar with the extent of the corridor. Um, it extends essentially from, from Te Aumutu in the south, uh, right through includes um, uh, Hamilton, Huntley, Merimeru, Pocono, Tuko, Pukukoya, right up to Papakura um, in the north. Um, and essentially about five kilometers on either side of the, the expressway. Um, the, the Future Proof Partnership was relaunched um, in August last year. Um, and the, the, the previous Future Proof structure, which you can see on the left of your screen, uh, these were the original Future Proof members. They were joined by the members on the right hand side. That's um, Auckland Iwi, Tamaki Makora Iwi, Central Government, Auckland Council and Franklin Local Board and, um, and hence the, the Future Group Implementation Committee was reconstituted to include um, these additional members. 
And as I mentioned, uh, Mayor Allen and Councillor Beck are uh, Wakat mm -hmm. District's Council's representatives on, on the committee. Um, so that committee is essentially responsible for overseeing the work of Future Proof and the Hamilton to Auckland Corridor uh, initiative in, in particular. Michelle, yeah. I have a question, Michelle. Okay, Councillor Church, um, I'll, I'll enable you to ask a question now um, because I can't see I can't see all the respondents on the screen, but go for it. Yeah, so you've got the Waikato DHB involved, which I think is a great idea. Are they, because so, of course we've got the county's Manukau DHB, which could have been added as well, or yeah. is Waikato DHB going to be the liaison closely with the county's Manukau to ensure that the, the northern border is covered from that point of view? Which way is it going? Absolutely, that's a very valid point. Yeah, you're 100% correct. So um, counties Manukau DHB and Waikato DHB are already working very closely. And so, so to other the two education um, uh, entities for Waikato and Auckland as well. So absolutely, they're both working closely together. Yeah. So just, just moving on, um, in terms of the key um, focus areas for the H2A, uh, corridor initiative, Waters is a key one, and I'll cover some of the key uh, projects shortly. Those are all indicated uh, on the screen. Um, stronger corridor connections, which essentially it relates to ensuring that we better connect our communities, as well as Hamilton and Auckland um, with regards to the uh, movement of traffic, people, and, and goods. Um, the third one is a Papakura Pukekohe Tuko uh, Pokemon, um, uh subregion. Then we have the river communities, which essentially includes all the all the main towns in the Waikato district, extending from Tuko in the north. It includes Mercer, Merimere, uh, Tukopata, uh, Hinawai, Huntley, Taupri. Ben my Narawai here is uh, both Narawai and Taipei are both in the Hamilton Metro Spatial Plan as well as in the River Communities um, uh, Spatial Thinking. So, but but the the thinking is essentially um, uh, aligned for 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 both those communities in terms of where they're going. And then the Hamilton Waikato uh, area, which um, uh, which entails the the Joint Spatial Plan for that particular area, and I'll come back uh, to this shortly. And then there's a six work stream, which is focused on implementation tools. And in fact, there's a, a workshop tomorrow, which um, a number of our councillors are attending together with um, our, um, our central government partners um, with regards to how do we uh, implement um, some of these, these projects over the next <clears throat> 10 years and beyond. So, Essentially, um, I guess um, it's important to note that the, those six focus areas um, are all um, being done in accordance with the, the spatial framework. Um, and this is referred to as the statement of shared spatial intent for the corridor, which essentially sets the growth management parameters for the corridor work. Um, a key one is to protect why he for to, i.e. places of enduring presence. This typically includes um, your significant natural areas, um, it, a very uh, a sensitive ecological areas, your, your lakes, your, your rivers, also um, uh, areas of subsidence and, and highly productive land as well. And then um, also acknowledging that we, do, we do, do need to develop our communities and develop the corridor but um, we need to do so in a responsible manner and be sensitive to Waihi Toyora areas, i.e. places sensitive to development, and we need to develop these areas with greatest care. Also, a key structuring element for the corridor thinking is the use of mass and frequent transit corridors. And this could be, this is mode neutral, but it could be trains, it could be um, uh, public uh, buses, and even to some extent using cars because the Waikato Expressway is a key uh, element of the corridor. Supporting and unlocking residential and employment development potential mm -hmm. of the corridor is key, as well as uh, supporting revitalization and targeted growth in river communities. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier unlocking new funding, financing and, and delivery option. 
Now I'm just going to move into the key the key focus areas um, and um, provide you a bit of more detail on the projects which you saw in the previous slides. The first one is is water um, or, or three waters, um, which is really water, wastewater, and storm water. So um, many of you would know that we face significant challenges in in the the region with regards to to three waters. Um, now, um, there are a number of abatement notices that have been served on, on the three partner councils um, by, by the regional councils in terms of um, uh, wastewater in particular. Um, there's a, there's a, a moratorium on wet industry in, in Hamilton currently. Um, the, our river, Waikato River is over allocated and there's a queue for water take applications. Um, the, the number of wastewater non-compliances, um, water quality, especially of the river and some of our, of our lakes, are degraded and, and poor. Um, there's increasing regulatory requirements um, like the uh, vision and strategy of the Waikato River, but also the national policy statement on fresh water. Um, some of our existing um, infrastructure, both waters and uh, wastewater as well as, as storm water are, are in poor condition and an urgent need for upgrade. So these are all some of the key challenges that we need to address if we are going to address to unlock the economic potential of the corridor, as well as to ensure that the environmental goals that we've set ourselves are able to be realized, but also to ensure that um, we spend our money, our investment wisely in terms of providing for or being able to service growth in a way that um, is done in a way that's efficient, but also achieves economies of scale. So that's a key, um, uh, a key uh, aspect of the, the thinking with regards to how we service growth um, as well as employment um, in the corridor. Now, uh, just moving on, um, one of the key projects um, under the, the waters um, work stream is a sub-regional three waters investigation. This is really considering a 10, 30, and 100 year planning horizon for three waters in the future proof sub region. So, this is much wider than the corridor, but it's looking at the entire Waikato River catchment. It's, it's really taking an integrated, holistic, and bound, boundary less approach that delivers the best for river and best for community outcome. And as I mentioned, it considers three waters in the structure water supply, wastewater, and stormwater. Um, the, uh, there are a number of project phases associated with this work. The first phase uh, entailed a scoping and strategic business case preparation, which was completed at the end of last year. Um, a full technical study and the delivery of an intergeneration investment program is subject to funding and we're working through a funding application uh, as we speak to draw down funding um, from central government uh, to enable the three partner councils to be able to do uh, the next phase of this work. And then uh, the rubber will really hit the road when it comes to implementing some of the key recommendations um, of the study. Another key project, which is also critical to the water work stream is the Hamilton Waikato metropolitan area, uh, wastewater detailed business cases. Uh, essentially, um, as some of you who joined the Hamilton Waikato Metro uh, spatial plan presentation last week would be aware that there are two um, business cases being prepared, one for the southern metropolitan area and one for the northern Hamilton metropolitan area for wastewater services. Um, and uh, the southern one is, is critical because we need to find a wastewater solution for Cambridge. Um, and this business case needs to be done uh, by May 2021, followed by the northern metropolitan area uh, business case, which will service areas like Tokofi, Horror 2, um, uh, Narawahia, and even Taupo and Hopu Hopu as well. So those will be considered uh, through the business case, which will need to be completed by December 2021. And as I mentioned, the funding uh, application for us to be able to, to fund these studies uh, is in the process of being um, developed and will be lodged with central government before the end of the year. Now, another key, key uh, project 
from a water's perspective or wastewater uh, perspective in particular, and, and especially um, pertinent to communities in the northern Waikato is the Pukekohe Wastewater Treatment Plant upgrade. So that should be plant, not plan. Um, so the first phase of that upgrade has commenced, and this will really release some capacity to service residential growth in the northern Waikato, southern Auckland area. The second phase will commence in 2030 and may even be brought forward. Um, so there's some work being done currently to ascertain whether uh, that needs to be uh, the case. And that, that second upgrade will provide for further industrial servicing, which is very critical um, for the Southern Auckland, Northern Waikato area, if we are to support employment growth um, in those areas. So, um, so this is a critical piece of work um, which has already commenced and uh, it will be very um, important to ensure that we're able to service both residential and uh, in industrial growth um, in, in northern Waikato especially. Um, Michelle, I have a question. Yes, Councillor Church. Thank you. So two questions, two parts. So the, the wastewater, the treatment plant in Turkau, uh, that you've just spoken about, when you talk about it covering the, the South Auckland and North Waikato, can you explain a bit further exactly where, where, what areas it does cover? Um, okay, I don't, I don't have a catchment map for the areas covered, but essentially as far as the key communities are concerned, Council Church, Pukekohe, um, Tuko, Pocono, so the wastewater treatment plant takes, um, takes water away from Pocono and Tuko, um, and treats it at the Pukekohe uh, treatment plant. So um, essentially, if we are going to unlock further growth, um, both from a residential and industrial perspective in both Pocono and Tuco, that upgrade is, is necessary. So, um, so, so I think you know, through the LTP process, um, there will be some discussions whether we need to bring that upgrade, the second phase two of the upgrade forward or leave it for 2030 as is currently scheduled but also um, servicing southern communities in Auckland, um, like Pukekohe, uh, Pairata, Drury as well. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's in essence the, the, um, the catchment area for that wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, so I understand where it covers in the North Waikato. It was just, I can ask you offline whether, uh, what in the South Auckland's covered, but the second part of that is uh, with, the, with the increased rapid growth in, those, in that whole area, um, is are we online for the 2022 to keep up with that growth? Uh, so we're on track to finish the first phase of the upgrade by 2022, correct. So I confirmed that just last week. So that's on track, but it's the second phase upgrade, which will cater for industrial growth. Um, so that timing at this stage is slated for 2030 to commence, but uh, we will confirm that uh, for uh, once the analysis for um for that timing is completed so but yes yeah, certainly as far as things wasn't my question i guess i'm thinking i'm just trying to re reframe it um is that an upgrade in time or is any growth potential growth ham being hampered by the not coming the phasing not being finished by the end of 2022 yeah, no, so look, uh, currently we are able to, to service existing growth, right? We are able to service existing growth, but we will not be able to meet full capacity in terms of all the growth we've envisaged and all the timing of sales that we have in Waikato 2070, the District Growth and Economic Development Strategy, the timing and sequencing of the, the growth in those sales is dependent on that upgrade being completed. Yeah. <clears throat> so just, just moving on, and this is just a high level map showing the key um, towns or communities in the river communities um, area. So the green areas you see, Turco, Pocono, Tukovata, Huntley, Taupuri, Narawaya, uh, these are really the, the areas that we're going to be focusing growth in. Um, as I mentioned short, uh, uh, short while ago uh, in response to Council Church's question, and um, we've developed um, uh, development plans for uh, a number of these towns, uh, which is incorporated in Waikato 2070. So these development plans really provide the basis for 
where the growth is going to happen as well as where employment um, is going to go. So the, it's important that we are able to, to implement those plans and ensure that we're able to provide services to support uh, that growth. So certainly um, some of you will be aware um, that um, not, not everything is, is um, finalized yet. For example, for TUCO, um, the zoning of land on high quality soils to, to further expand growth in TUCO is currently being considered or will be considered through the, the district plan hearing process um, early next year. So um, that's, that's quite a, um, uh, a contentious issue, but um, that's, that's the direction of growth for TUCO that council has uh, signaled. Um, and that's, that will be dealt with through the district plan hearing process. Um, but some of the other communities um, as well for Pocono, there are a few um, uh, private developers who have lodged submissions to the district plan. So that'll be heard through the hearing process as well. Uh, for Tecopita, it's a bit more, it's a bit different because Tecopita, there's, there's a well-planned growth. A lot of the growth has already been planned through structure plans as well as to lakeside development, uh, private plan change. And uh, a lot of activities is, is already happening uh, into Tecopita. And then um, Huntley and, and Tarpri, um, although those communities are more constrained uh, with regards to how they can grow, um, but there is certainly a um, growth plan for those, um, those communities as well. And I'll come back to, to Tarpri a bit later when talking about the, the Metro Spatial Plan. Um, moving on to the, um, the third focus area um, in terms of stronger corridor um, connections. Um, this is really focused on um, public transport within, within the corridor. Um, now, a number of you will be aware that uh, the, um, the Tahuya startup passenger train service between Hamilton and Auckland will be uh, op operative um, hopefully by February next year. It's a five-year trial starting in 2021. Um, there'll be stops at Franklin and Hamilton, um, the base, um, Huntley and, and Papakura. It's a two-week uh, two, uh, weekday return services and there's also a Saturday service as well. Um, it, we, we're currently working through a business case process to possibly extend the service to Kohonui uh, between the airport and Manukau um, in 2022. Um, council, through its LTP deliberations, will also be considering further business cases, um, for example, to Kerbata. Um, with regards to Pocono Tuco Pukekohe uh, train service, um, just be in mind that this is not part of the Tohiwe thinking, it's more in line with the Auckland Metropolitan Network. Um, thinking, uh, especially with regards to uh, e extending electrification from Pukukoi down to Pocono. Um, now, Council has made a number of submissions over the past um, four or five years to central government on a number of processes like the, gov the government policy statement on land transport, the, the rail uh, plan as well, uh, just advocating for extension of this electrification from Pukekohe down to Pocono. Um, also the two main parties, um, both Labour, uh, Minister Twyford um, in his presentation on the rapid rail business case, which I'll, which I'll touch on shortly, did allude to um, um, his um, desire to see this electrification being extended down to, to Pocono as, and, and the national parties also signaled that this will be a project that it would like to see implemented should it come to pass. So certainly at a political level, there is a lot of interest in terms of extending electrification from Pukekohe to uh, Pocono. And, and that's, that's government support is critical for that to, to happen. Michelle, the timing of that is a long way away. It doesn't seem common sense to the residents in the North Waikato where the train's going right past their, their front doors while the electrification work's going on where if that's three to five or, or even possibly further out years, let's say even eight years out, then they yeah. could at least have a service of twice a day to the commuter suburbs, which, which they are desperate for now. So rather than actually being sequential one after another, and it won't happen until the electrification, 
the, the common sense doesn't seem to be there. That's a feedback I get and I agree with that it, we couldn't have been added in the North Waikato to the existing corridor work, uh, to Huya. Um, yeah, so the key, we need to bear in mind that um, we need to make sure that the Tuhua service can, can, can offer a quick service between Hamilton and Auckland. Um, now, um, the, whether that's going to stop at, at Tuco and, and, and Pokemon in the future remains to be seen. It's really dependent on, on also the rapid rail um, um, initiative being, being implemented. Well, as you said, Council Church, that's longer term. Uh, electrification of uh, Papakura to, to Pukekohe will happen in 2023. But in the meantime, we're also involved in the Southern Auckland, Northern Waikato uh, Transport Connections um, study together with NZTA. And that's going to look at how we can connect our communities um, better. And it may not necessarily be rail. It could be, you know, buses, dedicated bus lanes. Um, connecting some of these communities mm. and connecting um, these communities to some of the railway stations as well. So, mm. yeah, look, I mean, I absolutely we understand the desire of some of you know every community mm. wants a, a, a train station, but that's not always uh, possible uh, because we need to think about the the level of the service as well as well as the how we're going to fund the the service and the stations. But um, the, the the trial service will really depend. Uh, help ascertain the the demand, and we will also be continuing to advocate, um, you know, through the work that we're doing on public transport in general, um, for um, for consideration to be given to rail in the northern Waikato, and that's something that council, as you know, was quite strongly focused on before the um, the focus changed to the Hamilton to to Auckland um, connection. Now, just just um, in terms of of rapid rail, so this was um, this is an uh, indicative business case which was launched by the minister two weeks um, ago. Um, so um, the 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 business case is really looking at how best we can connect Hamilton to Auckland um, in a by rail um, using a high speed a high speed solution. Um, so um, the, this is seen as a key backbone to the, the corridor and the other projects obviously happening like the, the Tohuia rail service, um, also work happening in the Hamilton Metro station plan area with regards to mass transit and frequent transit. There's the Tiawa cycleway extension um, and also public transport connections in the river communities, which council will be considering mm -hmm. through subsequent LTPs uh, with regards to bus services um, in, in particular. Now, just moving on to, to the, the rapid rail um, interim business case, mm -hmm. there are four scenarios being considered. Um, the first one is, um, is really um, uh, one of us, a, a slower service, one hour, 53 minute connection between um, uh, Hamilton CBD and, and Auckland CBD, um, and then um, you know, extending to uh, a, a fourth scenario, scenario D, which takes one hour and nine minutes. Um, both um, scenario A and scenario B will require improvements to the existing rail alignment, whilst scenario C and scenario D will require the development of an entirely new rail um, corridor. Obviously, scenario C and D are much more expensive. So in total, we could be looking at between $3 billion for scenario A to about 15 to, to 20 billion dollars for, for scenario D. So this is just a high level uh, uh, presentation of, of the scenarios, but uh, the next phase will require the development of a more detailed business case, which um, the minister has indicated he'd like to see starting um, in 2021. That in itself could take two years. And Jack, uh, Council Churches, going back to your question, yes, it will take some time. But um, yeah, whilst we whilst we have this this vision in mind and this aspiration for a high speed solution in mind, as I mentioned, there is work happening with regards to how do we connect our communities in the interim in a cost effective way. 
And then, of course, uh, Waikato Expressway is a key strategic transport corridor for the the Waikato region as a whole, connecting Auckland as well as uh, Waikato and the Bay of Plenty. And it will improve economic growth and productivity through the more efficient movement of people and freight. Um, the construction has been done in terms of um, in, uh, seven sections. Um, six sections are completed and the seventh section, which is the Hamilton section, is due to be opened late 2021, early 2022. Um, so um, that this project is certainly, um, uh, some of you would have driven it already, so it's one of the, the better um, expressways um, in the country or sections of expressways in the country. And, and certainly, um, you know, that will have a tremendous positive impact for uh, growth and productivity um, in the Waikato region um, as a whole. I'm just moving quickly to the, the next focus area, which is Papakura, Pukekohe, Tuko, Pocono. And here again, just going back to my earlier comment about transport connections, the Southern Auckland, Northern Waikato uh, transport connections business case will be looking at how best we can connect these communities. Um, which um, really, um, you know, the, there's such strong social and economic linkages between these communities. They, um, they depend on, on each other in terms of movement of, of goods and services, as well as people, as well as access to, um, to uh, amenities, for social amenities as well. So that's a key consideration in this piece of work. Um, you will be aware that um, State Highway 1 Public Correct Bombay project has, has already started. I think there was a presentation done um, last week to the Onofaro Tuko Community Board or the Pocono Community Committee uh, on this. Um, I mentioned the Northern Waikato Southern Auckland Transport Connection Business Case. Um, and I know that um, the bus service between Pocono through Tuko and Pukeko Station is long overdue. This was supposed to have been implemented last year, but there have been delays. Um, uh, by the regional council, and then uh, obviously, um, you know, um, COVID-19 uh, hap uh, happened, the lockdown happened in March this year. Um, we understand that it's on track to be implemented before the end of the year, so an update on this will be provided to uh, the Pocono Community Committee and the Honorable <coughs> Community Board uh, in, in October, but certainly um, the message has been given very strongly on behalf of Waikato District Councillors to the Regional Council that they want the service to be up and running, um, whether it's, um, you know, COVID or not, uh, before the end of the year. So, um, so expect, expect that to be, to be happening soon. I should also just um, uh, also reiterate that the key priority development areas in, in this um, sub-region uh, is Pocono, Tuco, Pukekohe, Hirata, Drury, and Opaheke. There will be a, a significant um, uh, public transport category. Um, so we'll need to also consider um, that as well, take that into consideration when, when thinking about uh, future public transport connectivity, whether it's rail or, or buses as well, because um, uh, that's obviously going to be uh, used um, quite, quite a lot by people living both in um, uh, people both in the northern Waikato and in the southern Auckland area, um, both in terms of being able to, to access uh, uh, key transport connections um, in, in Drury to, to other parts of Auckland. Michelle, thank you. That's really um, thorough. But when you're talking about transport connections, obviously if we're going to be progressive and modern, then those would also include um, trails and commuter tra transport along Kiwi Rail corridors or in between those towns and also along potentially state, the state highway. So in terms of the transport connections business case, where does trails and commuter, uh, you know, like electric, you know, using your sure. electric bikes, et cetera, where does all that come in? Sure, so by trails you're referring to walking and cycling trails, Council Church? Yeah, yeah. Walking, cycling yeah. or electric Absolutely. bikes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank, thanks for pointing that out. That that's a key that's a key focus area, and and it's something which the the Hamilton to Auckland um, corridor work is strongly advocating as well. So um, we we do have a trail strategy as Waikato District Council, but I understand that will need to be updated 
Also, our um, green network, we need to develop a green network um, strategy as well, which will need to consider you know, some of these, these connections as well. But that's a very valid point. It's not just uh, mass and frequent transit, it's also um, walking and cycling as well. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but so with the commuter, my understanding is that perhaps NZTA are looking at how they better utilise the state, particularly the state highway corridor, for a potential uh, dual carriageway for uh, you know electric bikes or or, or cycling, yeah. for example. And also, these conversations with I understand with Kiwi Rail, and perhaps discussing and being more open to the same sort of idea along some of the corridors. So, has yeah. any of those discussions around? not just the, the recreational trails and connectivity, but the commuter trails along yeah. some of the key infrastructure. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been, it's been um, mentioned, it's been um, like in the, in the discussions we've had uh, on the investment logic mapping exercise for the Southern Auckland, Northern Waikato uh, transport connection business case. We've spoken about this. Um, but obviously, um, you know, it's it's still it's still very much um, new thinking in terms of using those community trails. Um, but uh, also, it will require significant in incentivization as well, and not just from council, but also from from central government to encourage people to make use of it. But certainly, that's very very much um, uh, new thinking and something that's really going to be uh, some. Uh, uh, something that we'll need to see uh, or implement uh, as part of the thinking. I'm just going to quickly move on to the, the sixth um, focus area, which is the Hamilton Waikato Metro Spatial Plan. Now, I did a detailed presentation on this um, last week, or two weeks ago, um, to a group of um, people from community boards, committees, and community groups in the Hamilton Waikato metropolitan area. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm happy to provide you with a link to that presentation or to, um, to the document itself. But the Metro Spatial Plan was um, adopted by the Future Proof Implementation Committee last Thursday, uh, which was a significant milestone. Um, and this really paves the way now for this document to be incorporated into the review of the future group growth and development strategy early next year and the general public will have an opportunity to make formal submission onto this. Um, but the Metro Spatial Plan is really a 100 year, uh, takes a 100 year view of the Hamilton Waikato metropolitan uh, area. It identifies key communities for growth and development and these in the Waikato district includes Tawakui, um, Narawaia, Hapu Hapu, Hara too, and then Hamilton itself, um, especially uh, uh, the existing growth areas um, in, in Hamilton, and then Te Aumutu and, and Cambridge um, as well. And I guess the key uh, point to note here is a strong focus on, um, on public transport connecting these communities um, through mass and frequent um, transit um, connections, but also going back to Council Church's point, also walking and, and cycling uh, connections uh, as well. Um, so the, as I said, th there's a more detailed uh, presentation available for you if you're interested in this, but um, um, the, the, the Metro Spatial Plan is really a, a groundbreaking transformative uh, piece of work, which, um, takes uh, into consideration uh, a boundaryless boundary approach to planning for, for the sub-region. Um, and that's gonna be um, uh, consulted next year and then we'll start uh, uh, going into implementation um, of the plan. This, this is really a high level overview of the mass and frequent transit connectivity uh, in the Metro Spatial Plan area. And a key, a key structuring, spatial structuring element is this L-shaped corridor, which extends from Narawai here, includes central Hamilton CBD and, and uh, to Arukura um, inland port. So that's a key, key um, economic corridor over here. 
Um, just moving on to the last focus area, which is perhaps one of the most important um, focus areas, that's uh, funding and financing. Um, as you know, it's, um, it's great to have wonderful plans, but the key will come uh, in implementation. Um, so BIA, the Department of Internal Affairs, has commissioned some work to expand um, its toolbox of um, options that may be available to local authorities to address infrastructure challenges. Um, this really builds on the Infrastructure Funding and Financing Act, which was um, uh, enacted last month. Um, there are four pilots currently being considered by the Department of Internal Affairs, and these will be workshops, as I mentioned earlier on, um, tomorrow. Uh, involving some of our councillors. The, the, the projects are the Southern Hamilton and Waikato uh, Wastewater uh, Treatment Plants, the, uh, the Enhanced Hamilton to Auckland Rail Connection, uh, a sub-regional organic waste facility, as well as the Waikato Catchment Restoration uh, Project. So these, as I said, these are pilot projects and from these, um, we'll be able to develop this toolbox to ascertain how best we can fund other projects, which I've mentioned in my presentation in the Hamilton to Auckland corridor um, area. So that's a very quick overview of the H2A corridor update. Um, I'm happy to take further questions or comments, but I'll just hand over to Councillor Beck as the um, our future proof uh, representative um, at the governance body. Councillor Beck, would you like to say a few words? Uh, sure, yep. And you might want to stop sharing your screen so we can uh, see everybody. I think we've got 12 people on screen now. We might just all. In fact, we've got 14. Michael, you've got a couple of extras. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Um, I'll, I'll keep my comments fairly brief. I'm just conscious that with questions along the way, we've only got about a, a quarter hour left, and I think it's important for community board members and uh, chairs to have the opportunity to ask their questions and, and uh, get clarification. Um, but yeah, one of the things that pleases me most, I guess, uh, Vishal, about this work is we actually managed to, uh, to be a, a bit ahead of the game, uh, a bit ahead of where government was at initially. Um, so we started the H2A work um, uh, and, you know, the focus on three waters, for example, ahead of the government's uh, big push around two waters uh, that they're now um, promoting the drinking and, and uh, sewage. And again, we talked about transport and connectivity um, within the corridor, again, ahead of uh, you know, rapid rail and those sorts of things, which were probably, if anything, spurred on by the work we've done here. Um, so yeah, I just I just want to I guess acknowledge the the cooperative way in which all the partners, all the government agencies, uh, and two very actively involved ministers um, got this this project to where it is now. It's a really important piece of work, um, and uh, and the work streams I think speak for themselves in terms of their relevance to us not only today but you know over the coming decades as we uh, grow and, and evolve. Hopefully, without the um, without the the gridlock and the running out of infrastructure and so on that we we see in other cities, where um, you know to our north and south, where where that hasn't been quite as well planned. So I'll just leave my comments there, just conscious of time and, and wanting others to have an opportunity for their questions. Thank you, Councillor Beck. Any further questions or comments? I'm concerned at how much climate changes brought into all this because we're surely not going to be traveling by car unless we've all got electric cars and it seems that it's been left so long to put trains in you know it, all right we've only got a low population and it's a, a long a big cost per per kilometer but it, it does seem to me that climate change is going to catch us any minute now. Yeah, um, so, so Sue, that's a very valid point. In fact, a key 
um, outcome of the corridor work is to make sure that um, by providing for more public transport opportunities that would take people away from you know using private motor vehicles people will still use private cars that's fine but we want to provide more public transport opportunities be it mass or frequent transit um, so absolutely um, you know um, it's it will also require uh, incentivization by government if people are going to be use, using electric vehicles as well. And I know both, both uh, main um, uh, political parties are, are keenly um, interested in this area as well. Um, so um, yeah, so it, it is a key it is a key focus of the corridor work, uh, and the metro spatial plan as well acknowledges that a high proportion. In fact, Hamilton has probably one of the highest usage of private motor vehicles um, in the country. Um, but um, in the presentation I did, I can't remember the figure, but um, in the presentation I did last uh, last week, I did provide a figure which is indicates that it's very low usage of public transport in Hamilton. So we need to change, we need to change that mindset and we can only do that by providing for more opportunities, but also ensuring that we, we provide for growth in those areas where people can access public transport. Because at the moment, the growth is, is quite dispersed. We need to ensure that we provide for growth mm -hmm. and intensification in areas that can be serviced more efficiently and effectively by public transport. I think if I can just pick up on that, Rochelle, I think that's quite right, Sue. The you know, smarter urban planning, uh, which is you know, discourages sprawl, and encourages um, uh, intensification around uh, public transport nodes is a key part of what, what's driving this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and just switching to individual car journeys and EVs, of course, doesn't do anything for journey time or congestion. You know, we actually have to be, get people into to, um, yeah, to, to, to buses and trains. Well, the way the traffic is at the moment, I wouldn't dream of driving to Auckland anymore. <laughs> But then the train service would take me forever. <laughs> It'll be good if it's more frequent. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely, I think um, um, so. And the levels of service for the startup, the startup train service will will be looked at. Um, the the usage will be a key. The patronage will be a key determinant um, of of that. And um, as you know, covered. COVID-19 hasn't done us any favors as far as public transport is concerned. So um, we need to just um, make sure that, um, you know, we're able to ensure that people get back or more people are using public transport um, or more confident using public transport uh, post COVID. Um, and that, that's the first, first thing before we can make any more significant um, investments. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments? Yeah, I've got one for you, Michelle. Um, appreciate the update, and it's great to see how long, how far it's come since the initial sort of consultation a while ago. Um, I know MERS is not going to grow um, population or industrial-wise. However, there is going to be a large amount of tourism to MERS. So, has there much been thought given to like the tourism aspect? Because Mercer will certainly benefit from wastewater coming into the service centre and those sort of aspects and more regular and better public transport. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of development in that respect. So. Yeah. So, so uh, Liam, uh, when, when we were doing the thinking on the, the Pocono Toko Mercer spatial plan, now that thinking helped inform um, Waikato 2070, the district growth and economic development strategy. So absolutely, in terms of Mercer and in terms of the, um, the blueprint for you know, that area, we need to look at how we're going to support tourism activities, um, as well as not just Mercer, but also Pocono as well. And so, so that's something that will be picked up in those local plans um, and not, not yep. something... It, it did emanate from the spatial thinking, but the spatial plans will need to, uh, the, sorry, the local plans mm -hmm. uh, will need to provide the detail as far as tourism mm -hmm. is concerned. Cool, thank you.
Shay, can I just ask a question too, please? Yes, Dorothy. Um, when you're talking about public transport, is this just to do with trains or is it buses as well? Um, it's, it's both. It's, um, it's both trains and buses. Um, as you know, trains are expensive. Um, you know, the, the cost for the um, Hamilton to Auckland startup service is $93 million. Um, it's not, not cheap. And, um, and that's just, the, um, just for the five-year trial. Um, but obviously, we need to also think about how we connect our communities to, uh, using bus services as well. Now, in the Metro Spatial Plan, the Hamilton Waikato Metro Spatial Plan, we, we acknowledge that uh, there needs to be a number of feeder routes connecting our, um, some of the communities in the Waikato district with Hamilton. And the same as well um, in the river communities area, um, there will be requirements to provide enhanced bus services. Um, the key challenge would be uh, to ensure that people are using it so that it pays for itself. Um, but um, obviously, we just need to make sure that um, the uh, that people are able to use it to go to work as well as using um, for recreational purposes and uh, other amenities as well. So, getting back to your question, though, that you said to put it um, uh, Hamilton. You know how we've got a high usage of cars in Hamilton, and and the reason I'm asking is. The Huntley, Taupri and Narawahia bus service, it takes an hour and a half to get from Huntley to, to Hamilton. So if you're going to work, it's just not, it's just not feasible. Yeah. And it's, it's basically what I'm asking, I guess, is how can we make it better and more yeah. speed, whether we put on an express bus for workers. I know the schools have, but it's just too long to go to work on a bus. Yeah. So we all have our cars. Sure. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously, um, you know, the patronage to provide for a, a bus service, we need to make sure the patronage, we have the numbers there. Um, so um, another option will be to have more dedicated services um, using dedicated lanes, for example. But that's part of the mass transit, frequent transit thinking in the Hamilton Waikato Metro Spatial Plan. Um, which really looks at how we're going to connect communities like Huntley, Tarpuri, Narawahia into Hamilton. So that needs to happen, Dorothy. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we need to, it's, I guess, a, as a first step, we need to um, do a survey of our communities, which we intend to do um, hopefully before the end of the year to ascertain what service, the best service they would like but also, um, you know, how are we going to pay for it as well? That's going to be an important consideration, um, whether they want to travel At into the moment, it's or, working, or, you know, it's working, but it's just the time. I'm not quite sure how we fix that or how we can yeah, actually yeah. get it. But I it's mean, just the key, the factor, yeah. you know, 20 minutes in a car versus an hour and a half by bus. And yeah. it's, it's just, <laughs> you know, I don't, Absolutely. I have, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and look, we will provide this feedback to, to the regional council who, who provide the bus services and they're, they're aware of it. But as I said, I mean, for, for this service to, to run efficiently, um, we also need to be mindful that um, it needs to be affordable and, and at the same time connect a number of communities. So um, whether, whether there's appetite for more um, dedicated bus services and you know, how do we pay for it? That's certainly something we'll need to consider uh, if we want to provide uh, for more e efficient and effective uh, public transport. Thank you. Michelle, just on that, yeah, and I'm in total agreement that you know, we need to have more transparency around that because public transport does cost money on one line, but there's a lot of hidden costs of it and opportunities to save money in time, right? But I think if you're going to engage in any of these things around, particularly things like public transport, that we actually, the people who engage with, understand the scope of those costings first. Yeah. Because you can say, would you like a train? Yes. But would you like a train at $100? Or would you like a train at $1,000? Or would you like it at $10,000? Unless we actually scope it with some sort of information that's relevant, then we can't actually have a, a, a proper engagement. Yeah. And absolutely. Look, I think, as I mentioned, a, a first step with regards to bus services is something we'll need to consider 
in in the next LTP and subsequent LTPs as well. So, and then the train service, absolutely. Um, you know, in terms of, do we have a milk train service connecting all our communities? Whilst we have the rapid rail within Hamilton to Auckland, that's something we certainly, that will be the, the ideal. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll need to make sure we're able to, to implement it and, and make it happen. Yeah, but that's whether it's trains or buses, you know, it's mm. the same idea. We need to have them informed with their engagement with we're going to ask them what they Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's exactly what we're doing in that Northern Waikato, Southern Auckland Business Case Council Church. And um, obviously there's a, we, we do understand there's a strong desire from some of our communities, especially in Tuco for a train service. But that's why, you know, uh, we need to just work through it and see whether in the interim, whether it can be, that, that community can be best be served by a bus that connects Tuco to Pukukohi train station. Um, you know, until such time that Tuco grows and there's a much larger population there to, to, to be able to provide a train service and allow that electrification to happen as well. So it's, it's balancing all these different requirements and making sure we're able to provi provide affordable public transport at the end of the day. Liam, did you have your hands up? Oh, yes, I, oh. yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm, I'm um, Liam's wife, Darian, on the Mercer hi, Committee. Hi. Um, <clears throat> and just in reference to the transport side of things, um, it's, it's good, it's one thing to provide additional services, but it's, then it's another thing to make it actually appealing for those, you know, that, that want to take that um, public transport or the audience that we're trying to appeal it for. So um, I think not only engagement, what Jackie was saying, engagement in regards to cost, but also how those gonna, how those services gonna connect to um, if they wanna, you know, go to work on public transport. Um, I think like really if I was to get some kind of survey in the mail and I look at it and I go, oh yeah, you know, great, additional public a service, but what's that connecting me to? How's that going to relate to me? How's that going to appeal to me? You know, yeah. if I go to work on a train um, and I like one of the other ladies, I think it was Dorothy saying, you know, it takes an hour on the bus. Like, that's a bit crazy. Um, so therefore, what's, what's the appeal going to be for, for yeah. her, to catch her to catch public transport? Yeah. So, yeah, I think the emphasis really needs to um, be on how is those additional services going to help the audience? Absolutely. And, and look, Darian, one of the things that the regional council is quite keen to trial, and I know it was trials, I think Council Church, it was trials somewhere in the northern Waikato some time ago, uh, is a demand responsive service. It, a, bit, a bit like how Uber, Uber works. So something that, that enables greater flexibility. And um, that's something that could, could be considered as well. But we just need to make sure that, um, you know, um, that the, the that it would serve its purposes and, and address the, the issues that you and Dorothy have raised in terms of people seeing the benefits of using um, public transport to be able to connect to places of employment or places of recreation. Um, at the moment, a large proportion of, of movement in the Northern Waikato is still towards Auckland. Um, we, we do need to provide more employment opportunities on our side of the boundary, especially in places like Kuko, um, uh, Pocono um, and also the Kerbert and Huntley. So that's something um, which uh, Waikato 2070 has, has identified and um, you know it's not going to be the panacea or address all the, the traffic movements. It'll always be the bright lights effect of Auckland but we, it, we need to be able to make sure we provide people with a choice to work and live in, in the Waikato mm -hmm. as well. But also as far as recreation um, um, opportunities are concerned. We need to have more of that in the, the Waikato as well. We're going to need a change of mindset on the part of the public from, oh, I can just sleep in the car and go down the road. We're going to have to discourage that. But then we have to offer the other as an alternative, a viable alternative. I mean, we're not going to be able to carry on I mean, traffic in Hamilton these days is just terrible. And 
and there are all these empty buses going around. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mindset thing. Absolutely. It will require culture change. So you're absolutely right. Um, but also um, people need to see the benefits um, of using public transport. And, and I think going back to the point that uh, both Darian and Dorothy raise um, in terms of people need to be able to connect quickly to where they want to go to rather than being taken, you know, on a roundabout um, tour and, and then, you know, end up being at the destination an hour, an hour and a half later. So, so those are the, the things we need to, to consider about being able to be more, uh, to be smarter in terms of how we provide those, those opportunities. Yeah, because I just want to get an insight as to my experience on public transport and that was going to... Um, uh, to the stadium. So we started off in Papakura. We had to, it took shit, an hour, an hour um, to get to one stop. We had to get off at, uh, at that stop and then we had to wait and go and catch another train and that was just to get to the stadium. So in comparison, because I'm from Wellington as well, we I know it's you know geographically different, but the concept is that like ideally when you're making it appealing to people really they want to get on that one stop um and 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 get on in another stop and maybe a maximum uh depending yeah. on the distance is that's yeah. you know that's how long they want to stay on the public transport um obviously you've got to take into consideration maintenance therefore you have to bypass um the detour however the concept is getting on one stop and going to another stop in a short amount of time frame possible um and yeah and 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 then having um and i remember on our way back as well so we got off at um we got on the train stopped at one stop we had to wait for a good half an hour mm. yeah mm. half an hour and and then to get to the train to um pub Kura. now that half an hour so this is my experience if you've got kids with you from a um rugby game they're half an hour and you're at the train station at nine o'clock at night. That's not really appealing to any family. I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. So I think, I don't know, like yeah, I said, totally understand. not appealing. It's, 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 it's similar to the, the um, example Dorothy gave as well. Um, and you're talking about recreation. She was talking about going to work. But absolutely, I think one of the challenges um, in New Zealand is that the pattern of this development and Auckland especially has been so dispersed. So we actually playing catch up as far as public transport provision is concerned. If it, is, if it was more compact right from the very beginning, it would be much easier, you know, like some of the European cities have, have developed. But unfortunately, and even in the Waikato district and Waikato region as well, um, you have very dispersed settlements. So trying to provide for the critical mass and the, the economy of scale to, 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 to support good public transport is not, not easy. Um, so, but yeah, it, it does require a culture change. It will require, as mentioned by Councillor Beck, um, in terms of how we plan our communities, how we plan our settlements, more intensification, closer to public transport nodes, uh, making sure that uh, people have easy access to those frequent and mass transit um, um, uh, public transport modes as well. Um, and, and yes, um, I think that the, the lingo should be mode neutral. We, we need to make sure people can still use their cars, but there needs to be a greater focus on using public transport in a way that makes it easier for them to go to places of work or places to play. Mm. We've all got used to having too many cards. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, and again, it's, it's just because this is how we've developed, you know, um, like um, if you look, uh, look at Hamilton and the communities around Hamilton, you know, Tokofai, Narawahia, Cambridge, Tiamutu, even Martangi, Gordonton, you know, it's quite, quite dispersed. It's, it, it's, it ha it's not a compact settlement. Um, so to provide public transport to service all of these communities 
is always going to be a challenge, especially when we don't have large populations per se. But in the Metro Spatial Plan, um, it, it considers a population of um, a, a scenario of, of the sub-region, the Hamilton and Waikato sub-region growing to 500,000 people over the next next 100 years. So that's obviously, you know, um, will require a strong focus and commitment to make sure public transport, both frequent and mass transit public transport works. So, um, yeah, and so, and hence, hence why this plan was developed to make sure we're able to concentrate and focus growth and employment in, in these communities that can be serviced by public transport. Mm. Okay, we're now at this quarter past ten past eight. Um, if there are no further questions, um, what we'll do, we will um, we'll make the the link to the presentation available, uh, Teresa, and also the the Metro Spatial Plan presentation link as well for those who are interested. Um, just, um, I guess, bear in mind, um, the, uh, a lot of the, the projects I've mentioned is, is work in progress, but uh, we will endeavor to uh, update you at an appropriate time again in, in the future in terms of progress being made. Um, and also the uh, discussions that council will be having in its long-term planning process for 2021, uh, 2031, um, will be quite uh, important as well. So that's going to be happening um, over the next next few months. So, Councillor Beck, um, any last word from you? Um, no, not other than to thank the people who've uh, made a little slice of their evening uh, available for this. Uh, it is important work. Uh, the horizon is is long. You know, it's a, it's a hundred year view. Um, I'm pretty sure none of, well, I don't know, Councillor Maguire, you might still be a councillor at that time, I'm not sure, but um, it's a very long time, but we, we can see the, the price you pay for not doing it, you know, the price you pay for getting it wrong is that you spend lots and lots of time in the car, wherever you want to go, right, so by trying to think really hard about this key economic corridor stretching from the south uh, of Auckland to the south of, of, of us here is really important, so yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Council Beck. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good night, and we'll catch up again soon. Okay, thanks for everything. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Teresa. Okay.